and somebody that we would hope that you would take a serious look at and a serious consideration as he is, as I said, a true conservative and somebody who has a tremendous story. I'm going to be spending an hour or so with him on Monday's television show, and uh, then we'll have some more of that on Tuesday as well, so you can really get to know him and hear his policies. But he joins us uh, today on the program. Glenn, thank you for having me. Look, I, you and I, you, we go way back. You're yep. a longtime friend. I'm a big fan of yours, what you're doing to fight for the conservative cause. For your listeners out at home, I've always done the show remotely, calling in. This is my first time to physically come into your studio since you all have uh, modernized. And, and yeah. man, This is a beautiful, beautiful space. For the folks that only get to see it uh, on the podcast or on TV or hear about it, let me tell you, Glenn's done a great, great job here in this you. space. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. How's the family, first of all? Doing well. And Good. you can relate. I know you've got We've talked about our mm-hmm. kids before. My oldest, 13-year-old girl, she went to her first boy-girl dance a couple of weeks ago. I'm completely against this. Uh, I think <laughs> any dad, I, I think that is enough to convince every father to be for the oh, Second yeah. Amendment. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. I, think that it, uh, I offered to send the SWAT team with her. She did not want that. I offered to, to <laughs> my wife offered a chaperone. She didn't want that either. My my yeah. daughter, uh, when she started dating, I about put the kid into just a coma uh, because I brought my security to sit down and meet him. <laughs> and I just told the security, just play along. Sit at the other table. If I look over to you, just look at me. Look at your phone and then just shake your head yes. <laughs> and I had this kid so spooked that I knew all about him. Uh, and if you need any tips as she gets a little older, you call me. That's good. Look, <laughs> so I, I, I got some of good all ones. the fathers, I've got to imagine dating Glenn Beck's daughter's got to be pretty darn intimidating. Any boy that was brave enough to go through that gauntlet earns points oh, this just kid for showing up. The, the father, the next day, because I actually uh, uh, I ended the conversation, I, had a, I put a, a plastic bag in my suit pocket. And uh, we were just having pizza, and he had a Coke, and he drank the Coke. And at the end of the, the meeting, I, I said, are you done with that? And he said, yeah. And I took the plastic <laughs> bag out, and I put his Coke can like I wasn't touching it, and I was going to dust it for prints. And he said, are you dusting? I said, I just, you know, just, hey, just, no big deal. The father called me the next day, and he said, Mr. Beck? And I said, yes. And he said, did you dust my son's Coke can for prints? He was pissed. And I, and I was going to say, well, it was not really. It was just and I said, well, yeah. And he said, you, sir, are a genius. I have, I have daughters. I am doing it to them. Wait, just Let's not give away all of our secrets. Yeah, I don't want our daughters well. listening to this thinking, oh, they were bluffing. Oh, I mean, yeah. they, they need we, no, a no. little bit of uncertainty is a good thing. For oh, I have more for you, Bobby. Um, <laughs> okay, so you, you've got a family. You know what it's going to be like for them. You know that they're going to tear you apart. The next president, no matter who he is, is going to face Abraham Lincoln style problems. Why would you want this job? But that's a great question. And look, I think it's the same reason you continue to speak out. Look, you could easily just say, I'm going to stay at home and be quiet because you know when you speak out, people come after you. If the next president's going to do what needs to be done, we're going to have to upset a lot of people. We're not talking about incremental change. That's why I've said it's not enough to elect just any Republican. The only reason to do this, folks that are running because they want fame or they want glory, they're misguided. The only reason to do this, the idea of America is slipping away from us. Now, look, every politician will tell you this election is the most important one. This one really is. If we don't change direction dramatically, I don't mean gradually or incrementally, I think we're done. So tell me the most dramatic thing that you think, because this is we were talking about this yesterday. I want tax plans that say we're shutting down the IRS. We're going a completely different way. I, I want to hear big Silicon Valley type thinking. Bold ideas. Really bold ideas, because that's what will captivate the imagination. And quite honestly, that's the only thing that's going to heal us. So give me well, some Bobby Jindal, Silicon Valley. Well, and look, let's see. We can start with tax plans. Domestically, we have got to shrink the size of the federal government, not just slow its growth rate. I'm the only candidate that's done that. We cut our state budget 26%. 30,000 fewer state bureaucrats. All these other candidates talk about shrinking government. They've never done it. So my tax plan, every Republican's got a tax plan with lower rates, and we've got that, you know, 25%, 10%, 2%, three things that are different, radically different about my tax plan. So a bunch of these Republicans say, we want, you know, Trump and Jeb have said, we're going to have half of Americans pay no income taxes. That's crazy. I think that's crazy. I think everybody should pay something. Yes. And so our plan's got a 2% rate. It's not about how much money we raise, but it's the most important 2%. We're all in this together. If we want government to stop wasting money, we've got to care about it. It's got to be our money. It's too easy to think, well, that money grows on trees if we're not paying something. 
So you have a 2% rate up to what? So up to $10,000 for a single filer, $20,000 for a married filer. The next level is $90,000 for a single, $180,000 for a married uh, when you get up to 10%. So a Mm middle-class family, teacher, you know, a police officer married Mm -hmm. today, making $150,000. They're paying 25% today. They'd pay 10% under my plan. But it does two other things that are pretty dramatic. Number one, uh, number two, it also, it eliminates the corporate tax. Not reduces, it just gets rid. Oh, wow. These guys play games. They they hire accountants and lobbyists. They don't pay these taxes. Make the CEOs pay. And we get rid of a whole bunch of the deductions and all the loopholes. You know, we preserve five, but we get rid of all the other nonsense they put in the tax code. Here's the thing where the left, they're going to attack me on this, but I'm actually proud of this. We shrink how much money. We dramatically do, we cut 22% of the revenues going to the federal government over the next 10 years. Now, the left's going to hate it. They're going to say, well, you know, you can't do that. Well, if we don't do that, we're done. And if we elect a Republican president, and before we've had Republican majorities, Republican presidents, they slow the growth rate, nothing changes. we got $18 trillion of debt. We're drowning in debt. Now, this tax plan, it grows the economy. There are all kinds of numbers. 14% GDP growth, 6 million jobs, for 8 to 9% uh, wage growth. But here's the fundamental thing. Here's the most important thing we've got to do domestically. And then one other thing internationally, domestically. This president has done a great job changing the American dream to be all about the government taking care of us. That's what he's tried to do. We're on the path towards socialism. And we, let's just be honest about it. I mean, Bernie Sanders calls himself a socialist. Hillary's no better, and Obama's no better, and there are a bunch of Republicans that are on a whole lot better. They want to be Obamacare light. Look, if this election is about who can give away the most stuff from the government, we're done. We never win that fight, and it's not a fight worth having. We've got to look the American people in the eye and be honest with them. And say what makes America great is not that government gives you stuff. It's that you got freedom in this country. And we've got to fight to get that freedom back. Shrinking the government is not just about growing the economy. It's getting our freedoms back. But secondly, internationally, this country better be serious about And I know you've written about this. I know you feel strongly about this as well. We better be serious about the threat of radical Islamic terrorism. So tell me about ISIS. Well, look, it, it, first and, of all, and, 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 let's, start, let's start more basically with that. Tell me about Islam. The reality is, is Islam's got a problem. And, you know, I know nobody on this stage is politically correct, but let's just, you know, let's go ahead and be honest. And I know we're going to get a bunch of folks saying, oh, you're anti-Muslim or you're racist. That's nonsense. This is just honest. This is true. Islam's got a problem, and that's radical Islam. And what we need our president to say to Muslim clerics and leaders, they've got to do two things. At least one, they've got to explicitly say, they've got to condemn by name these individual, by these terrorists, these murderers. Let's call them what they are. You can't just condemn a generic act of violence. You can't say, oh, well, we're against killing. You have to say, no, these individuals are not martyrs. They're not going to enjoy a reward in the afterlife. They're going straight to hell where they belong. And then secondly, they have to explicitly say, we fully embrace religious liberty and all the freedoms for people of different religious beliefs that we want for ourselves. It can't be that we want freedoms for us, but we don't want other people to have those same freedoms. When it comes to ISIS, when it comes to Islam, you've got a president. We've got a president who went to the Pentagon a few weeks ago and said, this is a generational conflict. We've got to change hearts and minds. Glenn, they are burning people alive, raping, crucifying, torturing, killing Christians, other uh, uh, Muslims, other religious minorities. He wants to negotiate with them. We've got to hunt them down and kill them. He calls Fort Hood an incidence of workplace violence. If we won't name, acknowledge the enemy, Secretary Kerry wants to allow many more Syrian refugees in our country. We know ISIS wants to send terrorists. We know they want to send terrorists into Europe and America. Why are we letting them in? They don't even have to sneak in. If we're going to let them in the front door, why would we do that? Well, we're, we're accepting 15,000 in the next year, and they're all being vetted by the United Nations. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Jeez. I don't, you know, that's, that's insane. You know, we've just raised, just got a note uh, this morning, we have broken the $10 million mark in, wow. what has it been, six mm-hmm. weeks? Uh, all coming in in $100 checks, wow. trying to raise money to save the Christians in the Middle East, the Nazarene Fund. $10 million. So that tells me at least this audience is very well aware of what's going on, that we are now facing the St. Louis, the ship that we turned away in, in the 1930s, uh, that we're facing the same thing that the world faced before, an extermination of a race of people based on their religion. Mm-hmm. And I get a lot of heat from people, even in this audience, saying, you can't bring any of them here. Mm-hmm. My answer to that is, A, our vetting is m- far superior than anything the United States is going to do. Uh, second of all, how many members of ISIS are Christian? <laughs> Zero. How do you deal with the crisis of not the war refugees? Because if you're Muslim, far as I'm concerned, Saudi Arabia has got lots of room 
Jordan has lots of room. They can they know the difference between the bad guys and the good guys. The West won't admit it. So they can do that. How do you deal with the Christians and this open door in Europe that's going to crush Europe? Well, you're exactly right. What I worry about is those folks going to Europe have a much easier time than coming to the United States yes. where they can do us harm. Look, we get, the vetting is so important, and I applaud the generosity of your audience. Let's get to the root cause of this because this administration wants to talk Band-Aids. This just didn't happen by accident. You've got millions of refugees there because this president's failed foreign policy. Let's think. Let's just for a moment step back and think about what we're seeing today. So you've got Assad and Putin and Iran and Hezbollah working together. I mean, can you imagine this all happened because this president, he created a void. He said there would be a red line. He said if Assad crossed that red line, if he used chemical weapons, he goes, there are going to be consequences. It has been his official policy that Assad has got to go, but he's done nothing to accomplish that. He has said his official policy is we're going to hunt down and kill ISIS. He's done not enough to accomplish that. Then we've got to take the handcuffs off the military. You've had General Petraeus come to the the Congress and offer ideas. You've had other uh, military, current and former military leaders saying what we should be doing. Why aren't we arming and training the Kurds directly? Amen. I mean, we're going through Baghdad. The Kurds have been the effective force on the ground. Yes. Turkey is willing to help us to go in, and other Sunni allies are willing to go after ISIS. What they don't want to do is to go after ISIS if it leaves Assad in power. What they don't want to do is prop up Iran, a Shia power. They're not convinced America is in this to win this. So now we're in a position where our friends don't trust us, our enemies don't fear and respect us. Look, Putin went into the Ukraine and Crimea because he didn't respect the White House. Nothing, nothing of consequence happened to him, so now he's going into Syria. China's testing us in the South China Sea. Let's be, let's be clear about what's going on. These are big, big adversaries. They respect deterrence. They don't want a, a conflict with the United States. But if they feel like there's no strong pushback, they're going to keep doing this. Please. The problem yes. I have is that... We've got a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to apply our conservative principles. Yes. He's mm. not a conservative. No, he's not. He not even believe close. in anything. The, the, no. the Kilo case, the thing that he said oh. earlier this week about, uh, you know, eminent domain is just, it's shocking that there's a single mm-hmm. conservative on the planet that would say, oh, yeah, I'm for that. Well, it's eminent domain, but it was also a week ago on 60 Minutes, he says, that, yeah, government should pay for everybody's health care. Mm-hmm. That's Obamacare. That's socialism. That's one of the biggest issues facing our country today. And as if conservatives, conservatives as conservatives, if we give up that fight, what good is the Republican Party? If we go along and say, okay, we agree with the Democrats, the government's going to pay for everybody, we're done. Okay, we, uh, we're going to go in depth and on television next week on some, some things, but let me just touch base real quick. I've got three and a half minutes to, to touch this. You're 24 years old. You're running the state uh, health and hospital system in Louisiana, right? That's right. That's 24 right. years old. So you have to have some ideas on how we can fix uh, the health care system and get rid of Obamacare. And it bothers me when people say, repeal and replace. I don't want the state to replace it. Okay. Are you repealing and replacing? Well, we're repealing all of Obamacare. And what we're doing instead, no, we're not replacing. And when people say replace, too often that means Obamacare light. They mean, oh, we're going to create yes. another entitlement program. Correct. We're going to redistribute. We're going to raise taxes. No. No tax increases. No expansion in government spending. No. There are a couple of things we've got to do. We have a great health care system, but it had challenges even before Obamacare. Yes. Get rid of all of Obamacare. One, we should help have more competition to make health care more affordable. Allow people to buy insurance across, across state, state lines. lines. Amen. Thank you. I yes. mean, this is ridiculous. Jeez. Allow people mm-hmm. expanded access to health savings, medical savings accounts. <laughs> yes. Give people a standard tax deduction. That way they can decide whether they want to buy their health care from their employers themselves. Allow them to group into voluntary purchasing pools. Crack down on frivolous lawsuits. That would just doing that would drive those things would drive down premiums five thousand dollars for the average family. Secondly, don't expand Medicaid. Don't grow government programs. Provide very targeted help to those that really do need it. There are people with pre-existing conditions. Give money to the states. Block grant it. Let them. They're much better at the than the federal government. Whether it's high risk pools, reinsurance programs, and third, and this is the most important thing: put doctors and their patients back in control. You know, when I was the ED of the the Medicare Commission, the head of the Mayo Clinic said there were 130,000 pages of rules and regulations in the Medicare program. we got doctors leaving the Medicare program. One of the worst things Obamacare has done, I think it's immoral to spend money you don't have, make people dependent on government. But one of the worst things that it does puts bureaucrats between doctors and their patients, erodes the quality of care. Mm -hmm. When you're in that emergency room, when your child is sick, when your parents, when you're there in front of your doctor, do you want the doctor providing your care or do you want some bureaucrat in Baltimore saying, well, you know what? We've got this rule, and you got to do medicine A, B, C this way. 
That's one of the worst things about Obamacare and Trump care as well. Here's where we're headed, folks. If the government thinks they're going to pay for our health care, they're going to start telling us how to live our lives. And they already started that. They're going to say, well, this is what you can eat or drink. This is how many guns you can have. These are the activities. We're paying for your health care. We're going to tell you how to live your lives. That's the inevitable next step. And we're already, we're already seeing that with the micromanagement of our kids' school lunches. That's what's coming. Okay, I want to talk to you about, by the way, uh, we'll get into this in the TV show, but thank you for your leadership on Common Core. Well, thank um, you. You were, you've been dirt strong on it, and you've been dirt strong on it from the very beginning, and thank you for that. I like that term, dirt strong. That, <laughs> I, you need a trademark. I haven't heard that uh, many um, times before. I like that. So uh, 